little Old Testament book of Ruth. And we're turning to Ruth this morning, chapter number one. My text is in chapter number two, but I want to read just chapter number one by the means of introduction just to paint the whole picture for our text this morning. The Old Testament book of Ruth, please, chapter number one, commencing to read at verse number one. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Melon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, and that she might return from the country of Moab. And for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters in with her, in law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters in law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have an husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sake that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people, and unto her gods, return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee, for whether thou goest, I will go, and whether thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. And so they two went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass, when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? And so Naomi returned down Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, and returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. And Naomi 
had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant, That was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and she continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter, go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by mine maidens. And let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Amen. And we know that the Lord will bless that reading to our hearts for his name's sake this morning. Every time I read the book of Ruth, there's a great lesson that always comes out from this to me. And the great lesson that we find in the book of Ruth this morning, there's more to the book of Ruth than romance. And there's more to the book of Ruth than redemption story. And one of the great lessons I learned for my own personal life as a believer in the book of Ruth is this. No matter how dark the day, God can change everything. No matter this morning how difficult the circumstances may be, may be crippling, and you don't know where or how you're going to cope, yet even there, God can change everything. And I'll tell you another thing what the, bo the book of Ruth teaches me. The book of Ruth teaches me that no matter how distressing life can become, and mind you, life can become distressing to the child of God. And when it seems that it can't get any worse, even there, even then, God can change everything. You remember Joseph in Genesis chapter 37 when he was sold by his brothers to the Ishmaelites sent down into Egypt? When life couldn't seem to go any worse, yet it was there, God changed everything for Joseph. Do you remember 
Jephthah in the book of Judges, chapter number 11, the son of an harlot he was. That's what the Bible calls him, the son of an harlot. And when his father married and reared up sons of his own, his own sons threw him out. They wanted nothing to do with him. But that's when God changed everything for him, and God made him a mighty judge. Do you remember Moses in Exodus 14 at the Red Sea? And the Egyptians come on thundering behind them, and there was nowhere to turn, nowhere to go. Ah, but that's when God stepped in. And God changed everything. You know, child of God this morning, God can change your circumstance. Perhaps this morning, you're living under a dark cloud of uncertainty. You're facing a difficult situation. You're facing this morning an awful dilemma, perhaps, that's leaving life so distressful. Ah, but here's the lesson this morning. God can change everything. And do you see, when God changes everything, that's when everything changes, not just for our good. But God can change everything for our glory. And oftentimes, child of God, it's the lowest times of life when we're way down and there seems to be no way up that's when God oftentimes speaks upon our lives. God often speaks upon our lives in our darkest moments. It's in our darkest moments when God can change everything. I often think of Aaron's rod, you know. You remember Adder Aaron's rod when it was placed in the temple? It was in the temple all night. And during those hours of darkness, that's when that rod blossomed and budded and became beautiful. And sometimes God changes his own people in their darkest day and in their darkest hour. I said last week, and I referred to this lady last week, Joni Erickson, who was crippled and paralyzed from the shoulders down when she was 17 years of age, through two years of darkness and distress and depression, God spoke to her sitting in a wheelchair. And she spoke to her, he spoke to her through the text that we preached last week from, the Lord is there. And Joni Erickson Tada said, God changed my misery into a ministry. A ministry that she still is involved in today reaching thousands with the gospel. Oftentimes, it's in those low points of life when the clouds are dark and threatening and life can become so distressing. That's when God can speak upon your life change everything. You see in Ruth chapter 2 this morning, Ruth steps onto this chapter this morning, and life seems to be spiraling downward. The husband's dead. Her husband of 10 years, dead. And she steps on to chapter number two, and she's, she's burdened with bereavement. 
And not only is she burdened with bereavement, she struggles as a stranger. And you know, child of God, when I look at Ruth this morning, here's what I often challenge my own heart with. You and I may encounter many defeats in life, but we must never allow ourselves to be defeated. It may be necessary to encounter those defeat, but sometimes it's in those dark places where we realize where we really are. Can you imagine this morning, Ruth this morning, under the emotional stress of bereavement, there's some in this meeting this morning who knows what bereavement is. There's men in this meeting who knows what bereavement is, the loss of a wife. And there's ladies in this meeting, and you know what bereavement is, that through the loss of a husband, and unless you've had that experience, we'll know nothing about it. No, nothing about it. And for those of you who have been through the burden and has burdened that bur and still bears that burden this morning of bereavement, listen, you know how heavy the burden is. And here's Ruth this morning. Here's Ruth. And she's burdened here with bereavement. And she's struggling here as a stranger. She comes from the land of Moab. She comes into a new situation. And it's here where God speaks upon her life. It's here where God begins to change everything. My text this morning is in Ruth 2, verse number 3. Here's the, here's the verse. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. Here's my text. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz. And her hap was to light on a part of a field belonging unto Boaz. You know, friends, this morning, what in another translation put it like this, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. And when I look at that text this morning, do you know what I see? When she comes to this part of the field, I see an act of divine providence. And her hap was to light on a part of a field that was belonging unto Boaz. It wasn't by chance she landed there. It wasn't by luck that she landed here. Divine providence brought her here. So many of the world today believe in luck. And it saddens me today how I hear a lot of Christians saying, when they're saying, oh, this now, and touch wood. It's taught of what Christians would touch wood. But as I look at Ruth this morning and as I see her coming into this field, I see divine providence, God's hand was here. She comes from the land of Moab, just heartbroken. She's struggling. And her hap was to light on a certain part of the field belonging unto Boaz. Even in her darkest hour, even when she was burdened under the burden of grief, God's hand was leading her. And God's hand was guiding her. You know, child of God, here's something that the Lord wants you to know. God is in every circumstance of your life. God is in every situation of life. 
God is in control of everything that happens in life, whether that seems good or whether that seems bad. God's hand is there. When I look at Ruth this morning and I look at this text, this is what I see. There is a law from heaven for life on this earth. There is a law from heaven for life on this earth, and it's given a name, and that name is providence. Divine providence. And you know, child of God, God is to be trusted. God is to be trusted. Listen this morning. God is to be trusted when His providence seems to run contrary to His promises. Let me repeat that this morning. God is to be trusted when His providence seems to be running contrary to His promises. God is to be trusted. Proverbs 16 and 9, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. Did you notice when you come to chapter number 2, Ruth, she switches to self-survival mode. She says, I'm away here to glean the ears of corn. You know, there was something Ruth knew about the old Levitical law of the harvest. They weren't allowed to glean the corners of the field because whatever the corners of the field held, it was held there for the poor. And she knew this. She says, I'm away in here, and I'm going to glean whatever I can to keep myself going. You know, when life turns bad, child of God, listen to me, when life turns bad, isn't it powerful? Isn't it powerful how we switch ourselves on to self-survival mode? We, we take the situation into our own hands. We fail to recognize this morning that God's providences orders all things, whether good, whether bad. The 12th night of July, 1986, well, it was the early morning of the 13th of July, 86. The phone rung in our home. I had just got into bed, and my mother answered the phone. She says, come quick, George. Your father's been shot. And I mean jumping out of bed, running downstairs. Is he dead? Is he dead? No, he's not dead. He's injured. He's injured. And they're looking us out at the scene. My father, along with two other police officers, went out to a wee place called Rahai. Rahai House, it was. It was a place where all farmers and off-duty personnel used to gather for the Twelfth Night celebrations, and this was a target for Republican terrorists. That night, as they closed the station, one of the three men, one of the other two men says, we'll go out to Rahai and we'll clear Rahai before we go in. And the driver says, there's no pattern left in this car. And the father happened to say, well, listen, shall we still go out? And if we're running to pattern, somebody will tow us home. That's the way they lived life about often, Chloe. And they went out. They went out and they happened, my father happened to turn around to look out through the window and he noticed a boy sliding out of a car, and he says, there's a boy stealing a car. My father got out, and the next thing, they opened up. You see, that night on the 13th of July morning, they were planting a bomb there that was going to wipe everybody out in that place. And I remember, I remember going to Musgrave Park Hospital in the military wing where they were treating my father, and I remember the next day, the Reverend Bachelor, he was looking after things. Our minister was on holidays. And I'll never forget what the Reverend Bachelor said to my father. He says, Roy, 
You were in the hands of God. Even though you've been injured, God has used you three men to stop one of the province's greatest atrocities. And remember what the Reverend Bachelor said too. He says, Roy, you weren't there at the wrong time. You were there at the right time. And the Lord had his hand upon your life and you need to thank the Lord. And I remember a lady, a lady came to me two or three days after and she says to me, you read Psalm 124 and it says there, if the Lord had not been in our side, now may Israel say, but if the Lord had not been in our side when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us up quick. And people, people used to talk, oh boys, we were, you were dead lucky that night, dead lucky. I says it wasn't luck, it was the Lord. Divine providence is a powerful thing, you know. Divine providence orders all things in life, whether they seem good, whether they seem bad. For Ruth this morning, in this field, struggling as a stranger, burdened this morning with bereavement, it was here where God was going to change everything. One of the glorious things as we go through life is to know that our times are in his hand. You know, child of God, listen, God is in control of all aspects of life. Whether it's sickness or disease, God is in control. Whether it's bereavement or grief, God is in control. And as I look at this text this morning, I see this text, I see this field, it was a field of divine providence. I also see it as a field of delightful provision because when you go down to verse 15 and 16, it was a place where Ruth received blessings that she never, never requested. You know, even though Boaz did not speak directly to Ruth, yet she still received the blessing. God was seeing to it. God was seeing to it that her life would take a new direction. Child of God, there's something the Lord wants to teach you, and he wants to teach me this morning. Sometimes the dark, difficult, depressing, distressing times of life is what is the compass that the devil uses in order to change your direction. Perhaps there's someone here this morning and God wants to change the direction of your life. Don't you sit there and think, no, that's not for me. God may bring a dark cloud over your life. God may bring some difficult situation across your path. in order to turn you in the way he wants you to go. And here, as Ruth begins to glean these few ears of corn, Boaz speaks and says to, her, to the servants, drop a few handfuls of purpose to her. You want to know something? Maybe in recent days, God has spoken in your life and you don't know it. Ruth didn't know that Boaz was speaking of her. 
Maybe, maybe in recent days God has been speaking concerning your life. And very soon you're going to notice change. Very soon you're going to receive perhaps blessings that you never received before. And God is going to prove to you in some way that this is a direction that I want you to go in. You know, unknown to you, unknown to me this morning, God has perhaps spoken. God wants to change your circumstance. Maybe God wants to change my circumstance. We don't know. And what we realize in this field this morning, that here we have a field of divine providence, but it's delightful provision. Boaz's unknown command was to throw out a handful of purpose for her. You know what I find? I have found, and I'm bearing testimony to this, when the dark days come, and they're coming to my life as well, and don't you think they don't? When the dark times come, my problem is not trying to find God. Sometimes my greatest problem, I'm trying to find myself. It's not trying to find God. And sometimes when the dark days come, child of God, it's not finding God's the problem, it's finding ourselves. Sometimes, like this field of divine providence where God's hand brought her to, it was God's hand that brought her there. It wasn't luck or by chance. God's hand brought her there. And God's hand brought her to that place where she was going to find where she was. And God's hand may bring you to a certain place, dear, and God's hand may bring you to a certain point, brother. You might not understand it at the time, but God will in his time reveal it to you and to show you the direction in which you go. There was times when I was struggling in plum rates of place. I remember putting a load of mason radiators away one day. And I felt so unsettled. And little did I know, friend, away back then, God was speaking upon my life. And the place of circular employment that I loved for almost 20 years became a strange place to me. I was happy there. I enjoyed there. I was content there. But just like Ruth, God had spoken, but I didn't hear him. And God ordered it so and sent me in this direction. Sometimes dark days it's not about finding God at all. It's about finding ourselves. And you know, friend, when God brings you to that place, you'll notice things start to happen. Doors may start to have open for you. Things may change. Opportunities arise. But I'm going to finish with this one. It was a, div a field of divine, designed purpose. Her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging to Oh, sorry, but a uh, late on a, her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, and all this was to bring about a great designed purpose. This is where God was bringing Ruth into line. 
where she would come in line with the great lineage of the Christ. Here she is this morning. Who could ever imagined it? A poor foreigner and a Gentile at that. And God brought this foreigner and this Gentile into line to be in the lineage of the Jewish Messiah. Child of God this morning, and her hap was to light on a certain part of the field belonging unto Boaz. God planned it. God ordained it. God brought it about for this design purpose to bring her into line to be in the lineage of the Lord Jesus. A Gentile from godless Moab? Ah, yes. William Cooper was right, you know. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. Ah, friend, could it not be said of Joseph? Joseph said, ye thought it for evil, but God meant it for good. Esther, is it not said of Esther she was there for such a time as this? When you think of the wee maid in 2 Kings chapter number 5, a wee maid that was captured by the Syrians, brought down to Syria. Friend, did God not complete her pur his purpose there for her? Ah, oh, no, friend. Will you take a wee look at Ruth? Coming from the dark place of Moab, heartbroken, struggling as a stranger, doesn't know where she's going, doesn't know what she's doing. But under the divine providence of God, God works it all out, you know. Often say, hey Ruth, what verse of a hymn would you like us to put upon your epitaph on your headstone? I think it would have to be this one. With mercy and with judgment, my web of time he wove, and I, the Jews of sorrow, they were lustered by his love. I'll bless the hand that guided, and I'll bless the heart that planned when crowned where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. Those tears of sorrow were lustered by his love. Your tears are lustered by his love. The child of God, you just surrender to God's will for your life. And what purpose God is bringing or planning God won't bring it and he won't plan it without giving you the grace to endure it. I think of Naomi. You go to chapter 4, verse 16. Naomi away down in Moab. She loses her husband. She loses her two sons. I'm sure she thought the world, life wasn't worth living. The whole her wee world crumbled down her. And, and the whole story goes, you remember how Ruth marries Boaz and she has a wee boy, they call him Obed. And Naomi's the nurse. And in chapter 4, in chapter 4, you'll find her there, chapter verse 16, and just nursing the wee one. Just nursing him. She was made the nurse. And I'm sure that when she looked into his wee face and thought of the tears and the sorrow, she looks into his face and says, No, no, no. God doesn't make mistakes. This was all of his will. This was all part of his plan. And God wants to work out his plan in your life. May 
this morning in your circumstance, may you see the divine providence. May you find the delightful provision. May you understand the design plan that God is fulfilling in your life. And may God grant you his blessing and his grace to do that. May God bless his word to our hearts this morning.